Okay. Welcome to uh, Family Matters. This is week one of our discussion about the family, obviously, but particularly how God uses family and human relationships to bring glory to himself. I don't think I have to say very much about how uh, the family and the nature of the family uh, and and the uh, makeup of the family is an increasingly difficult conversation in our context. Uh, we know that not only has marriage uh, changed substantively and what it's defined as uh, in our culture, and I'm not just speaking about the reality of homosexual marriage, but I'm speaking also about the nature of what husbands and wives are committing to in the context of marriage. And not only is that uh, a question, a significant question that people are asking, but we also have questions about... Um, about children, whether children are good, whether there can be too many children, uh, that which is led in, in different cultures, and, and I think in some ways in our own to, uh, to the termination of the lives of unborn children. Uh, so we have a lot of significant issues in the family, in our culture, uh, and it's important that we understand those issues in their context. It's also important that we understand what God actually says about the family. It's important that we understand the purpose of the family and each individual person in the family unit. Uh, long, since, since the creation of the world, the family has been the foundation of human society. Uh, the family has been the foundational uh, context for relationships. Uh, it's, it's the way that God created us to, to have our first interactions with one another. Uh, and so we, we want to understand the family in light of what God says. We want to understand the family in light of what our culture says. And we want to discern how we can best bring glory to God through our family relationships. So in this course, we're going to take a kind of broad angle view at a lot of what's happening uh, in, in Scripture with regard to the family. We'll discuss a number of different issues uh, from, from uh, just generally who people are, who we are, and how that connects with the family relationships that we have. We'll discuss issues related to marriage and then in one of our other weeks, we'll have someone else. I don't have kids, so we'll have somebody else come in and talk to us about parenting, uh, specifically in the context of Scripture, but also, uh, hopefully, as many of our conversations will be, uh, those will incorporate some issues in our own lives and some personal experience. So I want to pray for us, and then we will jump into this week's conversation. Let's pray. Our Father, I thank you for the privilege of gathering with these brothers and sisters to consider the character of the family. Lord, we thank you for the family and the gift that it is to us. Lord, we understand that it's a difficult topic in our own particular cultural context. So, Lord, we pray that you would help us to read your word with clarity, to understand uh, what you designed the marriage and, and childbearing and, and the family to look like. Uh, Lord, help us to be obedient to that design and help us to remember what it does. Uh, that ultimately it enables us to bring the glory to you that you deserve. Uh, we ask that this morning you would help us to speak and think rightly as we consider what you revealed. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, we're going to talk today uh, about some foundational issues related to the family. Ultimately, our goal in this class uh, is to consider what we have recorded for us from Moses, from God, in Genesis 1, 27 and 28. So, if you have a Bible, go ahead and turn there. We're going to spend the majority of our time today in Genesis 1. 2 and 3, as we consider the nature of and, and the, the character of the family, and then we consider the consequences of sin in the family, we're going to focus our attention on, on the issues that are discussed in the first three chapters of Genesis. So our key verses for this particular course come to us from Genesis chapter 1, from Genesis chapter 1, beginning in verse 27. Actually, I'm going to go ahead and push this back to verse 26, because I think there's some important truth there. So beginning in verse 26, this is what we read in Scripture, uh, the words of God. Then God said, Let us make man in our image and after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. And so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So, so we'll discuss that passage a little bit further in, in, the, in the rest of our lesson this morning, but I want to focus our attention there. I want to focus on what God 
created humanity to be. Uh, prior to the fall, prior to the introduction of sin, not only into the world in action, but even into our natures, uh, and ultimately, as a result, into our families. I want to consider this, this passage as a sort of paradigm for viewing what fundamentally husbands and wives do, who they are in relationship to one another, and ultimately who we are in relationship to God. You'll notice in this passage that we have this discussion of man being created in the image of God, and then fulfilling a particular role in light of that image. I want to note that with that, we see the foundation of what humanity does. Our primary role is to bring glory to God. And in order for us to do that, what this course is going to suggest, what I'm going to suggest to you, is that in order to bring glory to God in the way that He intended, we must relate to other human beings as God intended. And despite the fact that our society has distorted God's design for us, we understand that the foundation of what God intended is bound up in these notions of manhood and womanhood and, and, and what God is intending to do through manhood and womanhood and creating the family. Uh, we understand that the family is the basic unit of human community. And, and we want to take the knowledge that we have of that from this text and others and apply that to our lives. So that's our goal for this class. We want to take the scriptures and we want to take what God's design was prior to sin. And we want to understand who God created us to be in family relationships and how God created us to live ultimately for his glory. So we're going to jump into this week's discussion. You'll find uh, booklets in the back that have uh, an outline that you can fill out. Hopefully that will help you as you think through this particular course with me and will help us to stay on target with our conversation today. So we're going to begin this morning by discussing what it means to be made in God, God's image. Uh, we read in verse 26 that God uh, in the heavenly council resolves, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. And this is a foundational theological concept that shapes the way we view ourselves and the way we view one another. So it's really important that we understand what it means to be made in God's image and how that affects human relationships. You'll hear Dr. York talk about this. You'll hear other ethicists talk about this. When we talk about the image of God, that's, that's what gives us ultimately value over and against all the rest of the creatures of the world. It's the image of God that, that forces us to think ethically about our relationships with one another. It's the image of God that calls us to value the lives of every human being and not just the lives of the people who are part of our biological family or our, our family as Christians. So the image of God is central to understanding human nature, and the image of God is central to our understanding of the makeup of and the purpose of the family. So today we're going to talk about what it means to be made in God's image. So for a long time, for, for thousands of years really, uh, human beings have been asking a central question. What is man? What is man? You'll remember that King David asked in the Psalms in a couple of different places. Psalm 8, for example. He asked, what is man, speaking to God, that you are mindful of him? And ever since, human beings have asked over and over and over again, who are we? Who are we? What is our purpose? Why are we here? And various religions and cultures and philosophies have sought to answer that question in various different ways. And today, more than ever, the idea of what man is, and I use man in the, in the broadest sense, is in humanity. The nature of man, the purpose and existence of man, his sexuality, his desire, his authority, his necessity, it's more debatable among people than ever. And the idea, in, in the eyes of many, the, the question of man and who he is and what he does, that, that's a significant question and a question that is open to interpretation. So that's a debate we're currently having very actively in our culture. But the, but the first question we have to ask when we ask the quest, question, what is man? The first question we have to ask, really, uh, before we can answer that question, is, is why man at all? So not only what are we in terms of our anthropology, what makes us up, not just biologically, but what about our souls? Do we have souls? What are our souls comprised of? What are our commitments? What are our callings? Before we get to that point, we have to ask, why are we here in the first place? And again, different religions and philosophies and, and people have answered that question in a variety of different ways. But we want to understand what man is, who man is, in light of what the scriptures say. And in light of what the scriptures say about why man is here in the first place. So why is man here? Well, ultimately we understand that the glory of God is central to understanding why we are here. So over the next six weeks, we're going to explore, as I've mentioned, why man exists, for the, what purpose we exist, and what roles we feel in that, in that existence. This, you, you came into this class expecting a class on the family, and that's what it is. 
but ultimately it's through the family that we begin to understand who God created us to be. So we ask why we are who we are and why we're here and why God created us the way that he did. Ultimately, we understand that the why of why we're here, as we'll see as we discuss the, these different texts together through the course of this class, ultimately we understand that the main reason that God created us is, is to bring glory to him. God created us to bring glory to him. And to that end, he created us in his image. He created us in his image. And we'll talk a little bit more about what the image of God is in a few moments. But the image of God is central to understanding man's being, purpose, and role in the created order. So I want to take a moment. We're going to watch a quick video about the conversation about who man is and what he does. And then we'll jump in to our outline for the course. In light of all the conversation about gender and identity, we began to wonder if there's even a difference between men and women anymore. We went to Seattle University to find out. Aware of the conversation going on in Washington State right now around kind of gender identity and gender expression issues in the ability to access facilities on those grounds? Yeah. Yeah, uh, like, you know, there's, there's general neutral bathrooms in like all the dorms and stuff like that. I think that gender is fluid, so if you want to use a bathroom because that's a place and that's a space where you feel comfortable and safe in doing so, then I think that that's completely fine. I think that if whoever you think you are, if you're male or female, then that's the bathroom you should go into. I think if it doesn't really negatively affect anybody, then I think anyone be, should be able to choose what gender they uh, choose to identify as. People, no matter what their gender identification is, they should be allowed to use whatever restrooms they should they, they feel that they identify with. Is there a difference in your mind between men and women? Um, no, yes. I mean, um, possibly in general, yes. But I don't know why I think that. Socially, currently, yes, there is. There is no need for that difference to exist. Uh, scientifically and logically. If you think that you're a male, if you think that you're a female, that matters more than the biological difference. There's not much difference besides what society forces on people. And how do you know the difference between men and women? By what people think they are. So you can't like judge someone just on like their looks. I don't think there's any one way to really distinguish between a man or a woman, and I don't think it's necessary. Uh, it's not always consistent. It has a high probability, like 98% of the time, I can get it right. There is some ambiguity. I think, yeah, there are ways to tell, but then again, you can always be wrong. What would you say I am? Just judging off of your looks, I would say that you're a male. I would probably assume a man, but then you never know. A male. Why would you say that? Based on how I look at you. <laughs> you think that's a problem? sociologists agree that uh, the concept of gender is more of a societal construct. I do think it matters somewhat, yeah. To me, no. I don't, I don't feel as if it matters to me because uh, at the end of the day, the person is just a person. No. I don't think it should matter. And the differences on a uh, social level are simply a product of a biased society. Then is there a reason to have those labels, male and female? I don't think so. I think that it's social construct of this binary that we're given at birth. There is kind of a difference, but at the same time, if someone wants to identify as one or both or nothing, I also find that completely okay. There may be nothing more self-evident in the natural universe than the fact that every animal species is divided into two halves, male and female. Yet the most intelligent species seems to be wrestling with whether male or female are actually real things. Have we discovered something new, or have we become too clever for our own good? Sometimes when I call a lady sir by accident, they get very offended. So you can see that these are really significant issues uh, as we think about what man and woman are and the purpose and function of humanity. Uh, 
Uh, you can see that even in this context, as we think about college campuses, uh, which are usually the points where these questions are most, uh, most relevant and most difficult to discuss, particularly for Christians, uh, I, I think it's important that we recognize that the, the nature and character of man and woman is, is more up to debate right now in the minds of many than it ever has been, even though, as this video indicates, uh, bio biologically, it seems obvious enough, uh, there's a redefinition of the nature of gender, of the nature of human relationships, of the nature of man and woman. And so we want to understand those issues and answer those questions in light of who God says he created us to be, in light of the reason that we're here, and ultimately in light of what Scripture says. So what then does Scripture say about who we are? What does Scripture say about what it means to be made in God's image, and how does that shape the way we view ourselves? Well, first of all, we understand that we're created by God. Foundationally, we understand that we are created by God. And we're not just created by God for nothing. Right? We're actually created by God for a specific purpose, to a particular end. So what are those ends? Why did God create us? What does Scripture say about that? Well, again, Genesis chapter 1 and following gives us some in answers to that question. So we were created by God to bear God's image. Found, foundationally, we were created by God to bear God's image. Now, that... that raises some questions when we read in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, that God in his heavenly counsel resolves, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And then later, God created man in his own image, and in the image of God he created them, male and female he created them. So, so what does that mean? The Bible doesn't give a definition for the image of God, um, but there are two terms that are used here to describe God's image when we speak about the Imago Dei. Uh, the first of those terms that we read in this particular passage is, is image itself. The second is likeness. You'll see those together in verse 26. Now, we don't have a lot of definition for what those mean in the context of Genesis chapters 1 through 3. But we do actually have a good idea of what those words would have meant in terms of the surrounding cultures around and among Israel at this particular time when they spoke about the image and likeness of God. If you read some of the research of, of, of Old Testament scholars into those, those words and into their origins and, and the common language, uh, scholars have identified a common, lang uh, common languages um, from which most of our languages come. So, for example, English and Spanish and French and, and the associated languages and, the, and Greek and, and, and uh, Latin before that all come from what's called the Proto-Indo-European language family. So you can find commonalities between English and even ancient Greek and, uh, and Latin and all these different languages beyond just what etymologies tell us. Well, when we speak about languages, we recognize that there are some consistencies among language, even at this particular time in history, as Israel is, 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 is coming from, from Egypt into the land of promise, uh, and, they're, and they're beginning to receive God's revelation and God's law through the prophet uh, Moses, and through their deliverer, Moses, who, who works uh, for God, uh, we begin to see these, these kind of concepts crystallize, and we understand them in part in light of what's said around them. So what do those words mean? Well, they're, they're kind of highlighting two sides of the same coin when we think, speak about image and likeness. On the one hand, in ancient cultures, we see that the word image uh, and the, is, is used with regards to a, a ruler, a king, a, a, a representative of God. So there's a functional purpose when we talk about the divine image. Uh, kings in ancient cultures represent God or their gods to their people. Ultimately, then, kings were considered gods themselves, but they're God's representatives, they're God's image on the earth. So that, like a statue, we think about a statue is the image of a famous person, so that we can see that image and understand something about who that person was, at least what they looked like. So also in ancient cultures, uh, they understood that their kings, that their leaders, their rulers were representatives of God to them so that they could speak with authority and exercise authority in their reign. So we understand that image is, is something that is a concept that's related to, to what we do as far as representing God. But, and when we talk about likeness, we're then speaking about the relationship between people and God. So that again, in those ancient cultures, there was this expectation that kings created in a likeness of gods were actually the children of their gods. That means that they are... Uh, similar to their parents, together the gods, in the same way that we recognize that our biological children bear certain resemblances to their parents. Uh, 
whether that's a physical resemblance or a resemblance that comes through mannerisms or a resemblance that comes through personality, uh, we understand that naturally that when we talk about family relationships, children look like uh, their parents, and, and they act like their parents, and that implies a certain degree of relationship between them. So kings created in the likeness of their gods had a special relationship to their gods. Their ki- gods were their, were their fathers and their mothers, and they were the children of those gods. So, th- so th- we can think about the, the image and likeness in light of those two things. On the one hand, it describes something about our relationship to God, that we have a special relationship with God as God's creatures. And on the other hand, if, if, we, if we use some of these concepts from ancient Near Eastern cultures to understand what is being said here, uh, image describes something we do with relation to the world. So relation to God, relation to the world. And it gives us this whole picture of what it means to be created in the image of God. Namely, that we are the image of God. Man is the image of God. We don't just bear the image of God in the sense that it's something that can be put inside of us and then taken out of us. But when we say that we are the image of God, we're saying that we are, by our very nature, uh, the, the special creation of God who have a special relationship with Him, at least as God designed it, and who now represent God even still in the world. Now, we'll talk about the effects of sin on this moving forward, but when we think about the image and likeness of God, and we think about being the image of God, we understand that we don't cease to be the image of God after sin. Instead, we start to represent God poorly. We are a poor image. I don't know if you remember a few years ago, there was a, a, a statue created of the, uh, of the Portuguese soccer star Ronaldo at an airport that was being dedicated to his honor. Uh, it was being named for him. And, and immediately when this, when this statue was released, when this bust of his head was released, people scoffed because the sculptor, a, a self-trained uh, trained sculpture, bleh, the sculptor, a self-trained sculptor, had managed to create this image that didn't communicate the, 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 the looks that so many people identify with, with Ronaldo. People, I, I'm told, think that Ronaldo is one of the most handsome men in the world. Uh, but this didn't look like a handsome man. It looked like a, like a sort of confused and amused and sort of askew man. It did not look like Ronaldo. Uh, it didn't bear the likeness of Ronaldo, and people scoffed and made fun of it to the point where they had to cr- commission a new bust that captured his appearance better. Now, the question that we have to ask is, was that first statue, the one that people made fun of so much, was it still an image of Ronaldo? Well, yeah. It just wasn't a very good one. <laughs> it wasn't a very good one. Well, so when we think about our relationship to God, right, even in light of sin, we still are the image of God. We're just not very good ones. And in, in that, we dishonor God. We don't bring glory to God because people look at us and they say, well, if that's what God is like, then what kind of God is He? He's not worthy of worship. And, and when we don't show who God really is, then we show that we've severed our relationship with Him. So we bear God's image. We were created God by God to that end. And, w- and we are God's image. But that doesn't mean that even now we do that in the way that God intended. Regardless, so what we can understand from the image of God and what's important for our conversation about why, we're, why we were created, why we exist, is that we, in and of ourselves, cannot be defined in and of ourselves. We cannot be defined independently. Instead, we have to understand ourselves in relation to God. The most important thing about you and me isn't you and me. The most important thing about you and me is that God created us and that we stand in a special relationship to Him. Consider again Genesis 1:26 through 27. Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female, he created them. We are God's image. We were created in God's image. And so we bear God's image before the world. So we were created as the image of God. We were created to bear the image of God. Uh, another thing that we need to note, though, as we talk about the image of God, as we think about being created in God's image, is that that implies that we were created for a purpose. right? We were created not just to represent God on the earth, not just to stand in a special relationship with God, but to glorify God. So we've mentioned that already. The chief end of man is, 
as if we hear from the Westminster, Westminster Shorter Catechism, uh, that what is the chief end of man? Uh, the chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. So the reason that we were created, the reason that we were created by God in his image was to bring him glory. By our very existence, we show the worth and perfection and the goodness of God. That means that the image of God includes some characteristics of us that, no, they're, they're not exactly like God. That God has a qualitative different, difference from us, not just quantitative. God's not just a bigger version of us, a bigger and better edition of, of humanity. He is qualitatively different from us as God. He's different in quality. He's different in kind from us. But at the same time, we understand that's why as we bring glory to God, as we demonstrate his worth and his perfection and his attributes, we bear certain attributes that we can identify with God. We call those communicable attributes. Those are things like love. Those are things like knowledge. Those are things like trustworthiness. All those attributes that we identify with God that are consistent with the attributes that are characteristic of us. That's part of being made in God's image. Right? We represent the character and attributes of God. And that's where it comes, it comes in, in, the, in the display that we are a picture of God. God does not have a physical image. Right? We learn from Scripture that God is spirit. We don't look at God in the same way that we look at one another. He's not made of matter. He's not made of substance in the same way that we speak about substance. He's not made of, of parts. But we are a picture of God in that we show who God is and demonstrate his characteristics and his qualities before the world. And it's not, the, it's not that the image of God is just a mere possibility, right? This is not something that we're striving to, not something that we have a choice to embrace. It's something that we have a choice to set aside. That the video that we watched suggests that you can set aside your gender. You can set aside your character as a person. Ultimately, we understand that we can't do that. It's not a choice of ours that we are created in the image of God, but it's a foundational reality of who God created us to be. We were created in the image of God, and we bear that image whether we want to or not, which means that, by implication, we have particular responsibilities. The fact that God created us in his image as his representatives on the earth with a special relationship to him by design means that we have particular responsibilities that accompany our creation. Right? So we, when we talk about the image of God, it's a wonderful thing. It should be moving to you. It should be convicting to you because on the one hand, it should remind you that you are special and that you have a special relationship to God, and, and that God has looked upon us, but, but not because of anything that we've done, but because of his own grace and mercy and created us for a particular purpose that is special over and against the rest of the created order. We were the last thing that God created, and we were the best thing that God created, at least according to the scriptures, and that should be moving, but that should also be humbling. That should also be convicting, because we sinned. And we resisted that, that creation that God intended for us. So we should remember that, but we should know that in light of all of that, we know that bearing God's image, being God's image in the world, comes with responsibilities. So, so what were those responsibilities? To what end did God create us? Well, God created us to possess the earth. That's a lofty concept. God created us to possess the earth. Notice what... We read in Genesis 1, 28. We read, And God blessed them, and God said be to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth, and what? Subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Similarly, in Genesis 2, 15, we read as the second, uh, the, the second look at, at the creation account comes into, vi- into focus, that the Lord God took the man and put him in the gardens of Eden to work it and to keep it. So part of what God created for was to possess the earth. He created us to fill the earth and to subdue it and to have dominion over it. We were created to be God's vice regents, God's vice rulers, the lords over the earth under the ultimate lordship of God himself. That's part of what it means to be created in God's image. We understand from the scriptures then that the earth was created for authority. Right? The earth was not created to exist in and of himself. It's not just a, a random chaotic place where the, where the strongest creature wins. The world was created for authority. It, it's not necessarily false to observe with, our, with the evolutionists that what we see in the world around us is the survival of the fittest, where the, where the strongest and most capable creature is the one that dominates. 
But what we discover in Scripture was that God's design before the fall was that we would see relationships among the creatures as one under authority. Namely, that humanity would rule and reign with authority over the earth, and that they then would be ruled by God himself. So creation needed a ruler even before the existence of a law. Uh, the idea of a ruler, the idea of a king, wasn't something that got introduced with a law. It wasn't something that got introduced with the existence of sin. The absence of sin never neg- negates the necessity of, of authority and order and governance. No, God created from the beginning an order that involves man ruling and reigning over creation. In the garden, uh, we read about in, in Genesis, and as we've read about in Genesis chapter 2, the garden was the image of what God intended. It was a picture of the order and governance that man was to bring, not just to the garden by working it and keeping it, but to the entire world. You remember what God says. He says that, that the offspring of man and woman would fill the earth and subdue it. So the mission of man, as he exercised rule and reign over the earth, was to multiply to the end that the offspring of Adam and Eve would then cover the face of the earth and subdue it and reign over it as God's vice regents. And, and so man was the, the authority in the earth. Man was the authority over the earth. Adam, the first man, the man that God had created from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, that Adam, under the authority of God, was the original ruler of the earth. And he, we see him in Genesis chapters 1 through 3 exercising that authority. You see him doing it in part by naming the animals. Remember that God brings him all the animals and he gives them names. And that's part of exercising authority. God gave man his name. God created man, and God spoke all of creation into existence. So we see this connection with naming and ownership. We see this connection with God speaking and demonstrating his relationship of authority to the rest of the created order. We see in Adam that God, uh, that, that God has given Adam the right and the authority to speak and to give animals names to demonstrate his authority over them. We see that, that, that Adam was the recipient of God's commands. What is it that God tells him to do? Well, fundamentally, again, in Genesis 1.28, God says, what? These are your commands. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion. So God communicates particular commands to Adam. Adam was the recipient of those commands, and he was tasked with the keeping and subduing of the earth. So God created man not just to bear his image, but as image bearers with a particular responsibility to possess the earth. God created man to possess the earth, to rule all of the created order in the way that God intended under the authority of God. So, as we think about the, the possession of the earth and the responsibility to possess the earth, and that means that God created man, God, we were created by God to rule all of life, to rule all of life. God created us under his authority to rule all of life. All life needs a ruler, even in perfection, right? All life, all life needs governance. Uh, all the created order needs order. And God, as he gave order to the, that creation, gave man the special burden, the special task of maintaining that order. Dominion requires both a ruler and something to rule over. Adam was given dominion. He would rule and the earth would submit. All creation was created to serve God ultimately, but to all, uh, through serving uh, through, in serving God, to also serve man, right? The created order was created to serve man. And God's command, or Adam's command, Adam's authority, Adam's role in ruling over creation was an extension of God's authority. God made Adam, God brings authority, or brings the animals, and Adam names them. God, uh, Adam demonstrates authority as the ruler over all life. We can then conclude that Adam was the first king. And this is something that Paul hits in Romans 5.14. Adam was the first king over the created order. And we were supposed to be, by God's design, his offspring and to rule with him. Yeah, got a question? Yeah. Yeah. So, I think part of that is just a description of ontology, like uh, of what we are. Uh, 
we are authorities over the fish. But I think, so I don't know if you're familiar with Aquaman, but like one of Aquaman's powers is to like do this mind meld thing where he tells fish what to do. And, and I'm not saying that necessarily that that's even what we would be doing. I don't know. Uh, but I think that the rebellion of the created order around us, and we think about this more vividly with animals like lions, uh, the scary stuff, uh, the Jurassic parks of the world like to, like to tell us that like, dinosaurs would be that way. We think about we think about um, about ruling over those things, and we think uh, we think, gosh, how could we ever do that? But what we what we see, I think, here is that the reality uh, is that animals in in, as, as a response to our sin, are actually rebelling. <laughs> like the created order as a, as a whole is suffering under the weight of sin so that it groans and waits for the revelation of the knowledge of the sons of God, as Paul talks about in Romans. So, so we see the consequences of our sin and the effects that they bring on the animals so that, I think, they don't submit to us in the way that they should. Now, I don't know what it looks like. Perhaps, to some degree, uh, there's, there's distinctions in words that are used in the Old Testament for animals. So when we speak about livestock, we're speaking about domesticatable animals. That's the fundamental idea, uh, idea there. So a dog is actually like a livestock because you can domesticate it. You can lead it where it should go. Cows, obviously, are the same way. And then there are animals that can't be domesticated. Funny enough, that includes house cats. Uh, we have a house cat. We love our cat. Our cat does what he wants to do and does not care what we ask him to do. Uh, you know, like, I, like that's when we start thinking about the tigers and lions of the world, and we start thinking about bears. Uh, that's when we start thinking about all these other animals. There's reasons that you can't just bring a wolf into your house and, and raise it and hope that it turns out to be a dog. Uh, they've tr- people have tried it, and it hasn't worked. Uh, so there are some animals that are domesticatable. There are some that aren't. I think probably that what having dominion over the created order, including fish and all those kinds of things, looks like is that all animals are domesticatable. All animals can be directed and governed with authority by men. But I don't know that for sure. Uh, I'm just just conjecturing based on what I think the text says. Uh, I think that the fact that your fish doesn't in some way respond to your command may in fact be a function of the reality of sin and the fact that the created order is perhaps rightfully, rebelling against us as its authorities. Does that make sense? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yes, that's incredibly helpful. Yeah, so like part of that means also that we're like, we're taking care of stuff. I don't know if you, you're familiar with Paradise Lost. Uh, it's John Milton wrote this, this incredibly significant work that is a, is a meditation on, a poetic meditation on the creation. Uh, there's a lot of theological problems in there. Uh, but one of the things that he suggests there with regards to creation is what it meant to have uh, dominion over and rule over creation in part was that there was this substantial growth and expansion of the garden happening. And so part of, of subduing the creation was like cutting it back. So just like we cut back the growth of a tree to keep it from growing in a place that we don't want it, just think about that's, that's what man's doing all day every day is just, it's just domesticating or, or, or or managing the created order in a way that keeps it orderly and, and helps it to ultimately accomplish its, its intended purpose. It's totally, uh, it's totally true then that part of exercising dominion over animals means that you take care of them. You, you keep them alive. And not that, not that the death, ne- death necessarily happened before the fall, but you're taking care of, you're, you're, you're providing their need for their needs if necessary. Uh, you're ensuring that they're in an environment that's conducive to their life so that you don't take your fish out of the water and set him on the table and say, try, really hard to breathe. Uh, you, you keep your fish in the water. So yeah, it's a really good point. Part of exercising dominion is just taking care of what you have. Uh, it may not follow your commands, and it may not say, you, you may not be able to say to your fish, you know, I want you to get up and walk, uh, but uh, you can take care of it, and you can provide for it. So that's a, that's a helpful conversation, because it's important for us to define what that ruling looks like because I don't think we can see it as clearly this side of the fall maybe as we would like. It's hard for us to fathom what it really means to have authority over a created order that doesn't like to submit to us and that we have to work for. Uh, 
I think I think that yeah, I think that's I think that stewardship is an aspect of dominion. So that when God gives man instructions, he says, "Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it." I think that part of having dominion is stewarding those things. So we th- we would think of a king, a good king, as being one who does yes have ultimate dominion over his 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 realm of authority, whatever that is. And part of him having that authority isn't just him telling his subjects what to do, but it's him stewarding his subjects and it's him stewarding their resources in such a way that they are becoming the best possible versions of themselves, right? So he's stewarding the economy of his people so that his people, not just he, but his people are growing in their wealth and and they're having lives that are comfortable and, and without struggle. Uh, so yeah, I, that that's stewarding them and stewarding them and stewarding their resources to a particular end. So yes, I think having dominion does include an element of stewardship. Uh, I think that's that's a key part of what it means to have dominion over things. And now I will say, we talk about the sin, and we'll talk, we'll talk more about it. The command to have dominion doesn't doesn't end. It's just harder. So you know, Adam is cursed. The ground is cursed, and it's harder for him to have dominion over the ground uh, and to produce fruit and to produce crops. But we also understand that that doesn't mean that our responsibility to exercise dominion ceases. We still have dominion. We still steward the created order. But because of sin, it's a hard job. It's a hard job to fulfill. All right. So we talked about we were created by God for specific purposes. Um, again, there's multiple texts here. Uh, you'll find them all throughout Genesis, Genesis 1 and 2, and we'll come back to them. So I want to move ahead. Um, we talked about being made in God's image means that we were created by God. It also means that we are commanded by God. We're commanded by God to do what? Well, we're first commanded to obey His Word. Foundationally, being created in the image of God includes responsibility. That means that God commands us to do certain things. And God commands us to obey His Word. A couple of texts here are significant for our conversation. Among them, Genesis 2, 16 and 17. <clears throat> this is a significant one. This is in many respects, the one command that God gave humanity in the garden. He gave them the command to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it, but this is the one specific command as part of that covenant relationship that God established with humanity that, that was specifically pertained to something they were to do or not do specifically. Um, Genesis 2, 16 through 17, And the Lord commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So God commands, or prohibits specifically, uh, prohibits man from eating of the tree that's in the midst of the garden. God commands us then to obey his word. Now that means, first of all, that God always communicates what he requires. Like God didn't keep some command off the table here. He didn't hide something from mankind. Uh, he, it's interesting when you read the account of, of the fall you read Adam and Eve adding commands into what God requires. So that Eve says that God commands us not to even touch the tree. Uh, that's not actually part of what God says. God says not to eat of it. So there's this addition of rules that's happening even among Adam and Eve. Uh, necessarily in some respects to protect them. I think that we can infer that maybe part of Adam's dominion over Eve is to add that prohibition for her protection. We don't know. But we, all, we do know that God communicates what he requires, and he communicates it clearly. Uh, God clearly teaches Adam the prohibitions of the garden, but the prohibitions of the garden were few. Right? The, the, the reality is there weren't a lot of them. There was one, and that's not to eat of the tree that's in the midst of the garden. There's only one tree whose fruit was forbidden. So the reality then that comes by implication of being commanded by God to do particular things and of being expected by God to obey his word, is that God not only commands us particular things, but he expects us to communicate what he communicates. So we have a responsibility to share it. Now, that obviously has implications for the family, and that has implications for our church, but it had implications for Adam. As the ruler of the earth, Adam was responsible for communicating God's requirements for humanity to Eve and to his offspring. As he exercises his authority, part of his authority is communicating with them what God requires. Now, God's communications are still communicated in the same way. God spoke to us by means of the prophets and the apostles and the scriptures, and we bear a responsibility as those who've received God's communication to testify to it to others. 
We also understand from the scriptures that the ultimate form of God's self-disclosure, of his self-revelation, of his communication of himself, was to the person and work of Jesus Christ. So we understand this even now. That, that responsibility hasn't changed. We still bear responsibility to take what God has communicated, namely the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and the scriptures that testify to that gospel, that testify to who Jesus is and what he did. That we understand that we have a responsibility to communicate that to other people. We communicate that to our husbands and wives. We communicate that to our families, to our children. We communicate that to our parents. If we have unbelieving parents especially. We communicate that to one another in the context of the church. And we communicate that to the world. So we still bear a responsibility to, to maintain that communication. But regardless, as God communicates commands, and regardless of whether we communicate them or not, God always requires obedience to his commands. God always requires obedience to the commands. God doesn't just give this as a suggestion. All right? This isn't a warning like a parent might warn a child to stay away from a fire. You, you can tell a child not to, not to touch. I remember when I was a kid, like, my parents taking the lampshade off this lamp. And they're like, that bowl is really hot. Don't touch it. And I was like, okay. And like, throughout the day, I was like, I really want to touch that bowl. I want to see how hot it is. To the point where finally like, I got bold enough to go over and touch it. And of course I got in trouble because I disobeyed, but ultimately that was a warning because there were consequences to what I was going to do. So yeah, God is warning Adam and Eve here not to do something because there are consequences, but ultimately what hap what's happening here is God's giving command, and because God gives it, there's an expectation that we obey it. God requires obedience to his commands. There's, there's no middle ground, right? There's no middle ground between obedience and disobedience. There's no doing what's morally right because it's what's best. Or what, it's what accomplishes our particular purposes uh, for, for our lives. Uh, there's obey or there's die. Those are the options that God sets on the table. And God expects, this, uh, expects our obedience even now. We are going to have a course coming up next year on ethics. And there's some debates about the nature of morality and what we do that are significant in the history of humanity and in the life of the church. We'll talk about those now. I'm going to show you a short video but I want to give you some context, right? So we've got multiple views of morality. I'm going to articulate a few of them for you. Christians have historically had two different views of ethics, of morality, of doing what God requires. On the one hand, we have a view of ethics that's called deontology. It's a fancy word that means we obey the law, that ethics is communicated through the spoken word of God, and that we as Christians fundamentally discern and determine our ethics based on our adherence to God's commands. And we trust that ultimately, because the, the foundational command that undergirds all the law and the prophets is the command to love God and love people, that that will ultimately cover all the ethical, uh, ethical requirements that God has for us, even the ones that may seem implicit. Now, later theologians and, and ethicists in the history of the church have understood that there is a freedom that comes to us through the gospel that doesn't obligate us to obey a law. So if that's the case, then how should we interpret ethics if we've been freed from the gospel and forgiven our sins? An alternative approach that was offered was a, a theory called virtue ethics, which says that we as human beings are morally bound by God to do, yes, what consists, uh, what, what's included in his word, but ultimately, when we make ethical decisions, we make, the best we make the decision that contributes most to our being formed into and conformed to the image of Christ. So, so we do the things that basically contribute to our becoming who God intends that we would be. Now, I don't think that deontology and virtue ethics necessarily have to be pitted against one another. I, think that, I do think that the foundational confession of Scripture is a deontological one. We obey God because God tells us to. God gave commands in the garden before the, before the reality of sin even hit the world. <laughs> there were commands to be obeyed, and I think that carries forward for us even now. But as we assess difficult virtue, uh, uh, difficult issues related to ethics and morals and things like that, I think we can say also with some confidence that the way that we address those difficult issues is by, in and of ourselves, seeking to do what most conforms to who Jesus is. Right? So if we're asking a difficult question that isn't specifically answered in Scripture related to ethics, then we need to ask, basically, what would Jesus do? And then we try to conform our behavior to him. All right? And that's not what the world teaches. There are a variety of other moral approaches to the world. There's, there's, um, there's hedonism, which essentially says that moral right or wrong is determined by pleasure and seeking pleasure, not just the pleasure of the individual, but the pleasure of society as a whole. There are different forms of hedonism. 
But today, the most common view is relativism, where you speak your own truth and you dictate moral truth by your own feeling. Uh, ultimately, that then gets filtered through humanism, through a commitment to the mutual good of other people that's determined, again, by relativism and, I think, in the minds of many people, by biology. So, this is a short explanation of what relativism looks like. This approach means we have always to be empathetic and think about the effects of our choices on the happiness or suffering of the people, or sometimes other animals, concerned. We have to respect the rights and wishes of those involved, trying to find the kindest course of action or the option that will do the least harm. We have to consider carefully the particular situation we find ourselves in, and not just take any rule or commandment for granted. We have to weigh out the evidence we have available to us about what the probable consequences of our actions will be. If we are thinking about what we should do, it is explicitly based on reason, experience, and empathy, and respect for others, rather than on tradition or deference to authority. This might sound hard, but luckily, most of us do it most of the time without really thinking about it. Morality is not something that comes from outside of Eternal force like a god. When we look at our closest relatives in the animal world, we see the same basic tendencies we recognize in ourselves affection, cooperation, all the behavior needed to live in groups and to thrive. It is clear that our social instincts form the basis of morality and that they are a natural part of humanity. Of course, that is not the end of the story. The long experience of tens of thousands of years of human beings living in community has developed and refined our morality, and we are all the lucky inheritors of that hard work. But it does not mean that there are not people who do harm or make bad choices. But ultimately, morality comes from us, not from any god. It is to do with people, with individual goodwill and social responsibility. It is about not being completely selfish, about kindness and consideration towards others. Ideas of freedom, justice, happiness, equality, fairness, and all the other values we may live by are human inventions, and we can be proud of that as we strive to live up to them. So, that seems all nice and noble. I don't know, it sounds great when you read something like that or hear something like that to see uh, the suggestion that we can determine morality and that it's something that's natural to us, and that it grows out of this concern for others, and that it's progressively accomplished. But ultimately, we know, with any real reflection on ourselves and on the world around us, that's not really the case. That there is significant evil in our own hearts that is also reflected in the lives of every other single human being. And that's not what Scripture teaches us. Scripture teaches us that that, that God gives us commands that we are called to obey. And the only way we're going to begin to conform to God's expectations for us, God's requirements for us, is if we submit to God's law. Ultimately, we trust that God's law for man is good. God's law for man is good. It's not a bad thing. And so that, so that we, we read about that in a, in a practical level here in the, in the text of Genesis, that that the penalty for disobedience is not, is not angry retribution, but it's fatherly concern. And God's at the penalty in place, death, related to the sin that Adam and Eve could commit by disobeying. He sets that penalty in place to protect them. It's an expression of fatherly concern. But when man breaks fellowship with God, there are consequences. When man breaks fellowship with the giver of life, the consequence is naturally death. So for God to keep this warning silent by not giving the command would have actually been unkind. It would have been cruel. But God, in his kindness as a father, protects his children from harm by giving them commands that teach them how they should live. So we don't want to 
confess this concept of, of, uh, of humanism, but even though it sounds noble when it's presented in that particular way, because we understand that it doesn't work, but we also understand that God knows better for us than we know for ourselves, and that it would be better for us to submit to God than to submit to our own conceptions of who we are and what we can do. So we are commanded by God, as we are made in His image, to obey His word. We're also commanded, we read in Scripture, by God to fulfill our role. We have a particular role in the created order. Man alone, by in and of himself, as in Adam, did not fulfill or capture the entirety of God's image. There was more that God intended for man. So that God, in his kindness, created another human being, namely woman. And that creation of woman uh, uniquely demonstrates uh, the, the equality and dignity of man and woman. Uh, God created man and woman equal, though he created them different, and he created them with worth and with dignity. No other system of belief can assert uh, or can impart more dignity and worth to womanhood than the fact that God created both man and woman. Right? A, a, a humanistic system can't do it. They can't argue for the inherent worth and dignity of women like we can because in their minds we're the product of biological processes and the strongest one is the one that should reign. And if men are stronger than women, then the men have more dignity or strength or honor than the women. That, that's potentially the argument that you can see there have, have taking shape. Foundationally, though, we as Christians understand and know from Scripture that man and woman are equal in worth and dignity, that God created us with equality in that respect and ultimately, we also read that, that apart from woman, God assessed man's individual existence in and of himself as not good. The only thing that's not good in the created order is man being by himself. That's the only thing that's not good. That's, that's the only thing that God doesn't conclude this is good. And, and it's only with the creation of woman that God concludes that creation was very good. So notice what God says in Genesis 2, 18 and following. Then the Lord God said... It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. Moving forward, but for Adam there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God called to deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with the flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. We read in Genesis the celebration of woman, the celebration of the fulfillment of God's design. Now, it's, it's, under, it's important to understand that woman was necessary to fulfill God's design for the image of God. Obviously, that's necessary because if there's just one man, he can't fulfill in and of himself the, the, the requirement to be fruitful and multiply. That requires two people. It requires, by God's design, a man and a woman. So that Adam's autonomous existence wasn't good, but with Eve's existence, it was very good. So we know that in some respects, in order to fulfill what it means to be created in the image of God, man and woman are both necessary in relationship to fulfill and demonstrate the image of God. Women were created because she was necessary. And she was necessary to fulfilling God's plan for humanity. But in that, we understand that God's image requires unique roles for man and woman. Man and woman are dependent on each other for various roles in their relationship. Each gender produces something that the other doesn't produce, as a means of survival, not just for individuals, but for the family unit. And this is true on more than just a physical level. This is true on more than just a physical level, level in that women bear children and, and, and men do um, physical labor in the, in the eyes of many people. That's a foundational view. Uh, There's more than just a physical thing. Um, we understand from Scripture that the role of man in creation requires the aid of woman. Right? Adam, Adam's task required a helper. And so God gave a helper suited for him, a helper who, who had qualities that he lacked to ensure that in their complementarity, that man and woman demonstrated the fullness of the image of God. So that they together were a picture of, of God and his character and all of its completeness and fullness. And so that they together could accomplish what God intended. So God created humanity to, to fulfill a role. He created both man and woman for a particular role. Lastly, we read that God commanded humanity. God commands us by God 
Uh, we are commanded by God to honor our vows. We're created by God to honor our vows. This is where we're going to move into a more practical direction. We understand that when God created Eve for Adam, that there was a marriage ceremony that, that, that accompanied it. If you read in, in Scripture, you'll notice this discussion of the relationship between man and woman as a relationship of a covenant, as a relationship of marriage. In Genesis 2, 24-25, we read, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh, and the man and his wife are both naked and were not ashamed. So there's this understanding here in the nature of marriage that there is a requirement uh, of honoring vows, that there is a marriage covenant relationship. And manhood needs and celebrates womanhood. Man needs and celebrates woman. Adam specifically celebrates and recognizes Eve as a gift to him from God. He proclaims, at last I have a helper suited for me. And even in perfection, Adam is longing for a helper for himself. Adam is longing for Eve. And then Adam names Eve. Yes, as a demonstration, like with the other creation, or the other rest of the created order of his lordship as God's vice regent on the earth. But, but in naming her woman, as, as the, in naming her as the one who was taken from man, there's this acknowledgement that she is of the same kind as him, and therefore she is equal to him. Right? So... so Lordship over somebody, ruling over somebody, doesn't necessarily imply a distinction in equality or, or dignity. There is this, this same dignity and worth ascribed to both man and woman here. There's also an acknowledgement of a distinction in roles as we honor our vows before the Lord. At the same time, womanhood needs and celebrates manhood. Eve immediately came under Adam's authority and love. And along with Adam, we, we infer from the text that, that Eve began to work and to, 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 to keep the garden. And in so doing, they together in their marital union demonstrated God's image to the rest of the world. So we're commanded by God to honor our vows, but there's a problem that accompanies that. There's a problem that accompanies that. Ultimately, we understand from Scripture that we are not competent. We're not competent to do several things. We're not competent to, de- to maintain Dominion, Genesis 3, 1 through 7, we read about the fall. We read that the serpent was more crafty than, other, than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, You may eat of any tree, of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, uh, You shall not eat the, of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. So, oh, I had a, I skipped ahead too far. Um, we were then, um, we are not competent to maintain dominion. We read in Genesis 3 about the fall. And we read here that man submitted to the beast, that man was created to rule over the created order, that man was created to rule over the beasts of the field, that at the appearance of the serpent, mankind submitted to the serpent, to the creature, rather than to the creator. That mankind abdicated his role and that he submitted to the beast. We also read in the context of Genesis 3, 1 through 7, that man, in particular Adam, submitted to Eve. So that Eve was the one who approached the serpent and was tempted by the serpent, who took their fruit and then gave it to Adam. We read this reversal of roles here, where Adam isn't the one communicating God's commands to Eve, but Eve is suggesting to Adam how he should follow in the ways of the serpent. So we see this failure of communication. We fail to see this failure of maintaining the created order. We see that Adam and Eve together do what's right in their own eyes against the explicit command of God, and we see that they fail to exercise their authority over the created order. Now, uh, again, this is a difficult concept in some respects because we understand as we read the text of Scripture uh, that man bears ultimate responsibility for what happens here. But Paul and others also may recognize that Eve is the one who listens to the serpent. So there's responsibility on both parts, and there's this destruction of God's created design so that both man and woman bear responsibility. But it's ultimately man who bears that responsibility as the authority for all that happens with relation to sin. And, and, and we are not competent then to maintain our dominion. 
We see that Adam wasn't competent. We know from our own experience that we're not, incompet- we're not competent to maintain dominion. But we also know that we're not competent to obey God's word. Adam and Eve both together failed to obey God's word. Notice in Genesis 3 verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took it of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. So we see this demonstration of disobedience. We see man and woman both violating a direct commandment of the Lord and rebelling against God. To be clear, the fall and sin was not just a simple mistake in the same way that when I'm doing a homework assignment for school and I have a typo in my paper, it's a mistake. It's not the same as as not knowing the answer to a particular question and making a mistake. It's not the same as not doing the right thing in the kitchen as you're cooking up a different recipe and it resulting in in a terrible result. Uh, That's a mistake. This is not a mistake. This is an act of willful rebellion on the part of Adam and Eve, and it's a demonstration of their incompetency to obey God's word, an incompetency that remains with us even now. Also understand that you and I are not competent also to fulfill our role. We understand in multiple ways that, 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 that our role has been altered and changed as a respect of sin. We read in verses 8 through 13 a number of different things. I'm going to highlight some for you here. We read that we're not competent to fulfill our role and that fellowship between God and man is broken. When, when sin happens, man hides from God, recognizes his own, na- uh, his own nakedness, and in shame breaks the perfect fellowship that he has with God by putting on clothes. So we understand then that we are incompetent to fulfill our roles uh, and, and that fellowship is broken. We see that we're incompetent to fulfill our roles and that, and that the roles of man and woman are reversed. Eve's natural stability, ability to submit, we read about, and the curses is replaced by a sinful tendency to usurp. So that God says that Eve, uh, would, Eve would have pain in childbirth. That's one of the curses that accompanies her sin. But he also says, with, re- with relation to the woman, uh, that she, her desire shall be for her husband and she shall rule over it. Traditionally, Christians have understood that as an expression of Eve's natural ability and relationship to man as one of submission, uh, being replaced by the sinful tendency to try to usurp man's authority. At the same time, Adam's ability to command the earth was stripped. We've talked about this a little bit already, but he has to fight against the earth. He no longer maintains the dominion over the earth that once allowed him uh, to, to do the work that God had called him to do in, in ease. It was still work, but it was, it was easier. Now it's a difficult thing, something that he has to struggle and fight against. And we see then that we're incompetent to fulfill our role because of the curse. The curse is the result of our incompetency in fulfilling our role uh, in, in Adam and Eve. And we understand that we can't fulfill our role because of the curse. Childbirth is no longer easy. God's image is distorted through the fall. Uh, we, we, we've argued already that though the image is still with us, the image is not destroyed. We're still the vessel that God has chosen to fill and to do and rule the earth with. But we understand that as we inherit through the failure of Adam, the effects of sin and the curse, that we no longer demonstrate God's image as we should, the image of God is distorted in us. So the reality is, then, when we talk about all these issues, that the family is broken in part, or in, in, in completion, because of Adam and Eve's sin. The family unit is broken. Individual people in the family are broken. We're incompetent in our own, in our own, in our own abilities to submit to God's design for the created order and for the family despite the fact that we've been given clear commands and that we were created for the purpose of glorifying God. But fortunately, and thanks be to God, despite the failure of Adam, we have Jesus Christ, who was the perfect man, who kept God's law, who was competent to do all that God required of him, and who is the one who redeems the people for himself, who fills the earth with his own people, who subdues it, and who rules over it. God created man in his own image to bring himself glory And because of sin, man's ability to glorify God has been broken. But God chose a second man, the Lord Jesus Christ, to redeem what the first man had broken. And so through faith in Jesus Christ, we can again find and fulfill our purpose and role in creation. The foundational commitment that we need to have as we talk about why family matters, as we think through our relationship to God as a family and glorifying Him, the foundational reality that we need to consider is who we were created to be, yes, why we exist, but also what's happened to us and what has changed our relationship to God. And we need to know and recognize how Christ restores what God intended and enables us to relate to God as we should. So Christ is the central focus of this class.
and of our conversation for the rest of our course. So let's pray together, and then we'll wrap things up. Father, I thank you for the privilege of gathering here with these brothers and sisters. We understand that we're not competent to do what you've called us to do. We understand that we were created for a specific purpose that we fail to fulfill. We thank you for Christ, in whom we've been reconciled to you, and through whom we can be the people you called us to be. We ask you that you would help us, and that you would direct us in the way that you would have us go. In Jesus' name, amen.